Good day and welcome to all of Adam's children to this week's sermon given by yours truly. Due to popular demand, I am going to do the unthinkable and go through and analyze all the trash in the Fallout series. Although it can be up to interpretation whether or not something can be considered trash or treasure given the state of things in post-war America, if it's on the ground and ignored by most people, we are going to analyze it in excruciating detail. So, turn up the rads, and listen to Rad Dad talk about the trash of Fallout. First up is this fine specimen, a soda cup, that can be found in Fallout 3. After doing exhaustive research, based on the size and the red and white pattern, I found that... Alright, you didn't actually think I was going to go over all the trash of Fallout, did you? April Fools! I hope you weren't actually hoping for a video where I look at all the pieces of trash in the Fallout series. Not even I have the gumption to get through a video like that. So if I'm not going to do the trash of Fallout, what am I doing? Well, I'm sticking with the theme. We're going to do the trash of Fallout in a manner of speaking. I want to talk about my least favorite part of each of the Fallout games. So this is the trash of Fallout according to Rad King. I don't hate any of these games, well, maybe one, so don't take any of these personally. You will likely have heard at least some of these in some form, if not all of them, but I would love to see how many of these you agree or disagree with. I love starting with the earliest games and working to the later titles, and this video will be no different. The original Fallout, the game to start it all, is highly revered by older fans, and if you haven't played it, you should absolutely give it a chance because it is truly great. You will have to get over a few hurdles until you get in the groove and feel comfortable, and one of those is the user interface, which is what I want to talk about. Now, like with most of these issues I will speak about, there is a reason it is the way it is, and that is always important to recognize. Fallout, in many ways, was ahead of its time, and in other ways, was a product of its time. The UI is definitely one of the latter, and one of the best ways I can describe the experience is busy and clicky. Let me explain. There are many menus and actions that the player must navigate successfully in order to progress through the game. At the bottom of the screen are many of the options with these small little buttons that you can click to bring up menus with even more small buttons and options. Now, to be fair, there are actually a good number of hotkeys that allow you to perform actions like initiating combat, closing combat, rotating the player, as well as using any one specific skill. These keybinds are extremely useful, no doubt, and I wasn't even aware of the number of hotkeys that there really are, but there are still a good number of functions that have no hotkeys and require you to get really comfortable with your mouse. Take trying to use an item in your inventory. You can either click the inventory button or use a hotkey to open the inventory. Scroll and find the item you want to use, but then you have to click and hold on the item to bring up a submenu that while holding the mouse button down, you move up or down to choose the command you want. This is something you have to do any time you want to drop an item or use an item like a stim pack, which are commands that you do really often. Bring up a menu like the character menu, and your only option to get through all the different information or select the skills that you want to change are to click through tabs or to select each individual skill. You can't use the arrow keys and there's no tabbing through to quickly navigate. Conversations with NPCs are another place that these busy menus can get a little burdensome. Although there are several keys to, for instance, quickly enter barter, or choose which dialogue option you want by selecting a number, which do work quite well and can be helpful, the same can't be said for easily exiting dialogue every time. Now since I brought up bartering, this just needs to be said because it is possibly one of the most annoying parts of bartering, but when buying a large ticket item with a bunch of caps, the most caps you can transfer at a time is 999. So if you need to pay for a 2000 cap object, you need to do one stack of 999 caps, another stack of 999, and a third stack of two in order to buy the object. 
You'll also be required to do quick math when trading items and shoring up trades with caps, which is not terribly convenient, but it's also not really a big deal compared to having the max number of caps that can be transferred in one stack at 999. Okay, back to conversations. The devs did a pretty good job of showing an obvious exit phrase, but sometimes you have to work your way through a number of non-committal prompts to find one that will let you actually exit dialogue. Now, there is a key to immediately exit dialogue, but it was meant for debugging and can completely break certain events. Take the conversation with Killian Darkwater in Junktown. After foiling an assassination attempt by some poor sap sent by Gizmo, you are presented with an option to help Killian or not. By choosing not to help, Killian, rather reluctantly, tells you that you will need to be locked up while he deals with Gizmo so you don't blow his whole operation. If you exit this dialogue by pressing the zero key, you will break this event, and when you talk to Killian again, he speaks to you like the assassination attempt hadn't even happened. The only reason I bring this up is because I know some people will point out that there technically is a way to get out of conversations easily, but it's not meant to be used for normal gameplay since it can break events and mess up your game. As part of the UI criticisms, the lack of a scroll wheel is really annoying as someone that is used to modern games that make liberal use of it. Again, this is related to the time when it came out and scroll wheels were not commonplace and some mods out there for the game can enable this functionality. While any single one of these are not a deal breaker at all, adding all these UI issues together make for a game experience that can be intimidating or unintuitive, and it takes persistence to adapt to. This can be one of the biggest hurdles for players wanting to play these originals for the first time, and unfortunately is a barrier that keeps many from actually experiencing it. The last UI criticism has to be how difficult it is to see small objects that you can pick up in the overworld. It is so easy to pass by loose objects because they're so small and there is no indication that they can be picked up unless you specifically hover the mouse over the object. Like look at this flare I just dropped. Or this rope that I dropped behind this bush. Ain't no one seeing that. It is so easy to never see this and just run by, and some objects are harder to see than others. Now, if you're wanting to play the original Fallout, don't let this dissuade you. It is absolutely worth the playthrough. Just be armed with this knowledge and have the patience to get used to some of these things, and you will be rewarded. Fallout 2 takes most of what made the first Fallout great and expands on it, often fixing things that fans disliked. For example, my previous issue with having difficulty seeing objects in the overworld is now addressed. Simply pressing the left shift will highlight items that you can pick up. That is awesome. While the menus still aren't streamlined like in the first Fallout, you can actually transfer more than 999 caps at a time, which is a very nice change as well. In the vein of having expanded on nearly every aspect of the original game, the Fallout 2 map is bigger than the Fallout 1 map. Not only that, but nearly every corner of the map is utilized, rather than the first Fallout, which has mostly one-time visited locations in the corners of the map that take the longest to get to. Now, you have large locations like San Francisco in one corner, the NCR in the opposite, with Vault City and Gecko up north in another corner. This makes traveling through the overworld between locations become very tedious and it can take several real-time minutes to walk from, for example, Navarro to the NCR, and that isn't even counting all the random encounters and battles that you will run into. Now of course, the game gives you the chance to get the Highwaymen, which really speeds up traveling between locations. However, if you are playing before you are able to get the Highwaymen, or you run out of energy for the car, you are SOL when wanting to cover a large distance, especially anything on the coastline. There are some missions that I just didn't complete because it required having to traverse the map and I didn't want to deal with the time investment or the random event roulette which has a nasty habit of dropping some very difficult encounters when I can least afford it. On the subject of the overworld map, specifically the coastal area, 
the usually helpful location selection menu can cause you some problems. It will choose the shortest route between two locations. However, when going between Navarro and San Francisco, for instance, it will try to take you straight to your destination, which always involves running into the coast and stopping because you can only travel over land. The way the map portrays the coastline, it isn't always clear what parts are traversable and what isn't, leading you to click around like you want Carpal Tunnel, trying to get unstuck from the coastline geometry. This existed in the first Fallout, but most people don't experience it because there is never really any reason to travel along the coast. Speaking of movement, this is something that is not unique to Fallout 2 as this also was present in the first Fallout, but I thought I would cover it here instead. When navigating a location, there is a limit for how far you can have your character travel. If you know exactly where you want to go, say for example you made it to San Francisco and want to go to the tanker, you can't just scroll over and click on the map exit grid that will take you to the tanker because your character can't travel that far. You have to click on a point much closer, then scroll, click on another spot, and then scroll again, doing the sort of leapfrog clicking until your character is close enough to the exit grid that they will get there on their own. This can be pretty annoying when you are just trying to get from one end of the map to the other and is most likely a built-in limitation, which was meant to allow the average PC of the time to not be overburdened which totally makes sense to me. The last of the criticisms of Fallout 2 is again a result of an old game being played on new hardware, but is the single most annoying thing I deal with when playing the game. When loading into some locations, the game will sporadically slow down so drastically that the game is just no longer playable. Looking online, there are many others that suffer from this, and again it seems to be a more recent phenomenon but there is also a distinct lack of solutions to this problem, and the only way I and others online can consistently fix it is to save, close the game, and restart. That totally breaks the flow, and if it happens more than a few times during a play session, can be enough for me to just turn it off for the day. Let's shift gears for Fallout Tactics because we have been talking about a lot of things related to UI and mechanics. Fallout Tactics is an underrated game that plays quite well and can have some very satisfying gameplay. However, while I do have some mechanics issues with Fallout Tactics, we're going to focus on the lore here. This is a common criticism leveled at the game and has been essentially since its release, but even after the release of four Bethesda titles, some of the retcons and inconsistencies, or whatever you want to call them, still stand out among the rest. I am treading old ground here now, but in Fallout Tactics, the departure from established Brotherhood of Steel lore was particularly noticeable because of how abrupt and contradictory it was, especially because of how prominent and loved the Brotherhood of Steel is as a cornerstone faction in the series. In the opening scenes, narrated by the series staple, Ron Perlman, the game outright states that the Brotherhood came from a vault, rather than originating from a military unit that defected from the Mariposa military base. And that's just right there in the intro. Many people have problems with how inclusive the Midwest Brotherhood is since they allow ghouls, super mutants, and even a kind of deathclaw to join, but they are in pretty desperate circumstances, so I think that's more forgivable. What I do find strange, however, given the Brotherhood's desperation, is they were somehow able to completely remake their own power armor. The Midwestern Brotherhood power armor is so drastically different from T-51 that there is absolutely zero crossover. Where did this come from? How was it made? We have no idea. The Deathclaw situation also got pretty strange since they were very much a reptilian monstrosity in the first and second Fallout and suddenly became a bipedal horned mammal that can talk. Now we had intelligent Deathclaws and they were already kind of divisive amongst the fans, but now not only can some of them talk, but they look completely different as well. This is a pretty blatant case of coming up with a fairly original idea and design and just slapping a well-known name on it from previous games, which is the worst form of fan service possible. 
There are plenty of smaller retcons that fall into the same category as the Death Claws, which can be difficult for fans that enjoy the lore of the series. Which I'm betting is none of you guys because Fallout lore is only for nerds and you guys are way too cool for that. We could spend a long time picking tactics apart, but we have more games to get through. Next up is the Fallout Brotherhood of Steel game, and my biggest gripe is that it exists. Next. Fallout 3 was my entry into the series, and even without having any prior expectations or preconceived notions, there was always one thing that bugged me most about the game. The karma system in Fallout 3 is completely borked, which is a shame because it can be a very influential mechanic, changing how NPCs interact with you, how 3Dog talks about you, what companions you can have, and lastly has an effect on some of the ending slides when you finish the game. Sometimes, whether you get good or bad karma just doesn't make sense. For example, at Paradise Falls, killing a generic slaver won't give you good karma, but killing some of the named characters with evil karma will give you good karma. To me, a slaver's a slaver. Roy Phillips, the ghoul who wants to get into Tenpenny Tower, is also a weird situation. If you go through with his plan and release ghouls into the tower, you will lose karma. However, if you kill Roy, you will also lose karma. Apparently, killing a bad karma guy isn't necessarily good, but nor is it bad. But killing an evil karma person is good, and killing a good or a very good karma person is always bad. But you know, these are usually edge cases that you don't encounter as much as the real problem areas of the karma system. The two biggest issues are that the game naturally pushes you towards good karma. Just completing quests that aren't all that inherently good or bad will often result in a net good karma. Even if you stole things and acted selfishly along the way, getting some negative karma. An example would be the Galaxy News Radio Quest, which has the player retrieve a relay dish from an old lunar lander to help increase the range of Galaxy News Radio. If this is your first time playing the game, you will feel compelled to complete the quest if you can't use a speech check to get out of it because there are just no other leads regarding where to find your dad. For those that have already played the game, they may just want to complete the quest so that Galaxy News Radio can be heard in all areas of the map, which is a purely selfish reason. The point is, players are incentivized to help 3Dog for what can often be purely selfish reasons, and it is therefore strange to be rewarded with a hefty sum of good karma. The natural course of the game pushes players into good karma, and you have to really go out of your way to push that karma down, doing insane things like blowing up Megaton, infecting Project Purity with FEV, or letting the feral ghouls into Tenpenny Tower. Maybe due to the ease with which players come into good karma, the game included a number of infinite karma exploits that can be gamified to help push karma in the way that you want it. It is usually tedious, but you can cheese your way through it if you really want to. If you have good karma and want to push it down for whatever reason, repeatedly hacking a computer of a good person will push karma down a tiny bit each time as will stealing items from an owned container. Don't steal all the items with one go. Repeatedly access and steal only one item until they're all gone. And these silly exploits can start to affect your karma, although you usually have to do it for a while to have any effect. Similarly, if you have bad karma and want to raise it, giving purified water to the water beggars or donating caps to a church will result in substantial increases in karma. Being able to balance karma as you wish is a good thing because having neutral karma would otherwise be impossible to achieve and is already very difficult to keep as you complete quests. However, what is silly about these karma balancing actions is that they don't make sense. Giving a water beggar purified water will give you plus 50 karma, while killing a good NPC will result in minus 100. So giving two bottles of purified water is worth the life of a random good wastelander... somehow. There should be certain actions that are just unforgivable, 
and result in never being allowed to go below or above certain karma levels. No amount of scrap metal given to Walter the Handyman at Megaton should be able to make up for the fact that I sold Brian Wilkes, a lonely and vulnerable child, into slavery. And if you want to know exactly how many units of scrap metal it would take to nullify literal child slavery, it's around 40. Certain actions should brand you for the rest of the game, like the child killer perk in the earlier fallouts, but enough small donations can erase any single evil act you can commit in the wasteland. The last point about the karma system is that some of the points for the different actions just don't make sense. Cannibalizing a corpse will only net you minus one karma, but stealing a frickin' tin can from an owned locker will cause minus five karma. How those two can be even a little bit equatable is just bizarre. And it's weird that you can kill a bad character without getting any good karma. Take their finger and bring it to the regulators, which will net you plus 10 karma. So the action apparently wasn't a net good until you chopped off the finger and brought it to someone else. To highlight how silly some of these karma amounts are, you can use the Mesmatron to enslave a human being, which results in minus 100 karma, but gives you 250 caps. You can then go to one of the churches and donate 100 caps for 100 karma, completely nullifying your atrocious act and still coming out ahead 150 caps. In fact, if you donate 150 caps so that you get a net karma increase of 50 points for every slave, you can become rich and attain the highest good karma title possible, Messiah, by selling everyone into slavery and just donating to a church. That's quite the Messiah you got there, Fallout 3. Fallout New Vegas is beyond reproach to many players, but nothing is perfect and everyone has their own opinions. This is far from a novel criticism, but the world of the Mojave can look much less interesting than it really is, and certainly less interesting than Fallout 3. On the one hand, I get it. It is the Mojave after all, and having driven through that part of the US myself many times, there really is a whole lot of nothing. However, it can be demotivating to want to go out and explore when you see a whole host of ruined buildings that have almost nothing in them where you find yourself in a supremely empty and uninteresting part of the map, like around the Ivanpah racing track, where there are few interesting locations and no noticeable or attractive landmarks to entice you in any one direction. New Vegas dominates the horizon in almost every direction and entices the player to make it there. But once you have, there just aren't as many cool or interesting landmarks that pique your curiosity and make you decide to head in a certain direction to investigate come hell or high water. Additionally, New Vegas made the decision to deliberately place high-level creatures directly between the starting point at Good Springs and the ultimate goal, New Vegas. This results in the famous loop, where the player travels east, looping north and eventually making it to New Vegas. While this intentional decision has some debatable upsides, it comes at the expense of allowing the player a level of freedom in where they want to go. Sure, you can find some janky little exploit and make your way to New Vegas, but again, you are stuck to using the few exploitable routes that fans have found after years of playing. Contrast this with all the other fallouts that didn't push you as hard in any single direction. That isn't to say that there weren't extremely dangerous areas that players could go to early where they would be hopelessly outmatched, but there is far more mobility and freedom than in New Vegas in this regard. Sometimes in Fallout 3, I decided to go in just a completely different direction than I have before on a new playthrough and complete the quests that I usually reserve for later in the game. Just having the choice to decide where to go feels nice in a series that prides itself on player choice. This brings me to the last part of the world and environment that can be quite frustrating and let's start with the most understandable one first. The segmentation of the strip of New Vegas is unfortunate, although understandable given a larger strip had serious performance issues on consoles. It still is a bit annoying, and a bummer overall that you have to go through several gates and loading screens to just go along the length of the strip, and a long unified strip would obviously look a lot better. 
The less excusable related point is the enormous number of invisible walls found inside the map area, not necessarily just the perimeter, more often in New Vegas than any other fallout. I find myself running into invisible walls, blocking an area that looks like I should be able to access just fine otherwise. I've always liked physical barriers that I can see as opposed to an invisible wall because you expect to be stopped by a mountain, a building, or a wall, but not by some invisible force keeping you from going somewhere that, by all means, should be accessible to the player. One of my big annoyances with Fallout 4 is a very well-worn path by now, because I am far from alone in this, but I'm here to talk about what I think is the trash of each of the games, and I need to put it on the record. The dialogue system of Fallout 4 fails on most merits, and the benefits that can be derived from it simply do not outweigh the cons. I think it is pretty important to state up front, I think the voice actors, both male and female, did a great job with their lines, and my criticisms have nothing to do with them or their work. The main issues I have with it lie in several factors that are inherent to a Fallout voiced protagonist, and other design choices that I think were just poor decisions. Let's start with those first, since I think they are the more salient points. The four choice dialogue selection is just a meme at this point, and an old one at that, but it deserves almost all the criticism that has been leveled at it. My first biggest issue is that you just don't know what is actually going to be said when looking at your dialogue options. They have been shortened down to try and be as succinct as possible and convey the idea of what is about to be said, but very often, the short description and actual words that are spoken don't align. This seems to be the worst with sarcastic remarks, which sucks because sarcasm is one of my core personality traits and it hurts me to see it abused. It is really a dice roll when choosing sarcasm. The soul survivor can respond in just so many different ways. He can make a lame little dad joke or use some pretty funny dry humor. Unfortunately, it can even be a straight up insult to someone without any warning at all. I personally would like to know whether or not I'm about to insult someone when I thought I might be just making a small but forgettable sarcastic remark. But that's the problem, you just don't know. This affects all the options to varying degrees and can be very frustrating when you think you know what he is going to say based on the prompt and then it's something completely different. As a player, you want to be able to make choices and feel like you have control of your character, but with this system, you definitely don't feel like you are always conveying the message you intend to. A similarly annoying issue is that we are only presented with four options. Although sometimes one option will expand into another menu of more options, but these are not all that common. Most conversations will be limited to four responses. This is in stark contrast to previous fallouts that never tried to limit the number of responses at all, and you could scroll through, see all the different questions you could ask or statements you could make in their full entirety, removing any ambiguity that is hidden behind these shortened prompts. By limiting the number of responses, we also run into some situations where we only have two real responses that we can make, but they pad out the other responses with different sounding ways of saying the same thing. The large DLCs like Nuka World and Far Harbor seemed to improve on some of these issues a fair amount, but there is only so much they can change when they have fully committed to a full response dialogue wheel that doesn't display the entire dialogue. Now it is fair to point out that conversations in Fallout 4 are more interactive than ever before, with the cinematic conversation shots that show the sole survivor interacting with NPCs. This was one of the good points of the new system, but it just doesn't make up for all the negatives. This system also makes it more difficult for modders to make story mods since they are limited to the lines for the sole survivor that are already in the game. Fallout 76 shared some of the pros of the Fallout 4's dialogue system, like not freezing time or locking the player into conversation, allowing the player to simply walk away, but is much better because they don't artificially reduce the number of responses and all the dialogue is fully written out so you know exactly what you're going to say. Speaking of Fallout 76, let's jump into that one. I am not going over the past issues with the game, rather I'm talking about the game in its current state, like all the other games. 
My absolute least favorite part of Fallout 76 is not the multiplayer aspect, which I think is pretty cool, rather it's the dependence on dedicated gaming servers. Now, I know there are many good reasons for a game to use dedicated gaming servers, including increased stability, greater scalability, etc. However, fewer things kill my enthusiasm to play 76 than when I go to boot up the game and I met with a message telling me that there is a server issue, whether scheduled maintenance or just some random issue, and therefore I can't play the game at all. There are times when I just want to play the newest Fallout title and experience it like the previous games, going at it solo and slowly going through the quests, notes and terminals to soak up everything I can, but I can't even load into the world because of a server issue, with as many problems as a peer-to-peer -peer hosting situation can have. I would prefer that setup more, being able to have a playthrough with one or more friends where the only requirement was both of you had the game and one of you could be a decent network host is my ideal situation. It would allow you to play with a friend when you wanted, but also just load up the game and play it locally when you wanted to play solo. Without being dependent on a Bethesda login, accessing a server, or having a decent internet connection. Of all the Fallout 76 players out there, I will likely be in the minority in this opinion. But one of the things about having a server-dependent multiplayer game is that unless some end-of-life changes are made to make Fallout 76 playable when these servers inevitably turn off, the game would cease to be playable, and that would be an absolute shame. I have yet to hear anything official from Bethesda, but I would think that they would have a plan to make the game playable when they no longer want to support the servers so that fans can replay the game or future fans can play it for the first time. Fallout 76 deserves to be preserved and enjoyed long after the servers go dark, but with no real hint toward this consideration by Bethesda and the complete dependence on dedicated servers, it makes me worried. Lastly, this is a rather selfish and inconsequential issue for most people, but it pertains to the live multiplayer real-time aspect of Fallout 76. Many functionalities were drastically changed in 76, like VATS and time-altering chems, and others were removed completely, like the ability to use console commands. As a content creator, the console commands are an absolute godsend, since I can choose exactly where I want to go, what I have in my inventory, and at what point I have completed for any single mission. Not having access to an infinitely roaming free cam and all the other commands that let me adjust the time of the day, the weather, the speed of the camera, just to name a few, makes the process of getting footage a lot harder, makes it take longer, and results in overall less quality, which just really sucks. Again, I get why this feature had to be nixed, since pausing or slowing down time in an MMO just isn't possible. But if I had the option to play the game locally on my PC without being dependent on servers, then there is no reason why it wouldn't be available like all the other 3D Fallout games. That is it, brothers and sisters. As always, I'm interested to hear how many of you agree and disagree with my trash of Fallout. Take care of yourselves. Walk in Adam's glow, and I will see you soon.